welcome. This is a special meeting and curriculum workshop of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, February 25th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at Fairmount School. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Member Miller. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Siegel. Here. Member Purcell. Here. Uh, we will be holding an extended reception of visitors this evening. Please make use of the cards that have been provided on the back table for the convenience of audience members wishing to speak. The board asks anyone wishing to speak, comment, or ask a question to sign in and indicate on the card your question or topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table next to Megan Hewitt. Uh, the cards are back there um, and used to provide an equal opportunity for everyone wishing to speak and comment and provide us contact information for any follow-up. <coughs> the basket's by the front. Yep, thank you. Uh, we will start tonight's meeting with one minute <clears throat> and 18 seconds of silence to remember Beth Dunlap and to keep her family in our, in our thoughts and prayers. <clears throat> I'm sure you all know Beth attended both Lester and Herrick here in District 58. Her mother is also a teacher in our district. We offer our prayers, love, and support to the Dunlap family and their friends as we celebrate and honor her life. First on tonight's agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items board members would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report as presented in the packet materials? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried and the consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet materials. As part of that consent agenda, I'd like to introduce the new principal of Henry Puffer School to begin next year. Mrs. Britta Wazak is here with us. Here's Britta. Welcome. <laughs> you welcome um, and the main event tonight is the curriculum workshop with Justin <laughs> Sissel thank you very much I'm gonna try to figure out where to stand with my back to the least number of people here so I may move around a little bit until we land on that. Um, good evening we have a number of topics that we want to explore this evening as part of our curriculum workshop first we will spend some time talking about curriculum in the district We'll do an update on both our curriculum council, that is a group working through our strategic planning efforts, and then also our curriculum committees, all of those that are currently uh, running in the district with an emphasis on our middle school exploratory and our art curriculum. We'll then spend a little bit of time talking about our assessment data. We'll do a, a brief overview of our winter map data and talk even more briefly about the Illinois assessment of readiness. And then we'll spend some time um, revisiting our professional learning model proposal for 2019-20 
in District 58. And then finally, obviously, there will be time for, as President Purcell mentioned, questions uh, from our audience at the end. So first, we're going to walk through an update from each of these committees. This list is actually not completely inclusive of all the, the committees that are running, but these are all of those that are currently working on curricular improvements, enhancements, revisions, reflections for our district. So just looking at that list, you can see there's quite a bit going on in District 58. Our curriculum council was born out of strategic planning. So this group is made up of parents, teachers, and administrators, and its job really is to address the objectives outlined in goal one of the strategic plan. S thus far, the, the major piece of work that that committee, that that council, excuse me, has accomplished is to develop a recommendation around a short-term timeline to address curricular resources in District 58. We, we knew that science was kind of in the pipeline and at our last board meeting we have adopted uh, new science resources to be implemented this fall. The Curriculum Council then took a look at the, the current state of curricula, received feedback from teachers and administrators and parents, and really thoughtfully approached what should come next. After gathering all of that feedback, we have asked the math committee to move forward in pursuit of new core curricular resources next in line with a hopeful adoption pending committee work in fall of 2020. And then the social studies committee would follow after that with a hopeful adoption of resources in fall of 2021. That's an ambitious timeline. And one of the things that the council emphasized through all of its work is that that timeline is manageable so long as we are finding ways to, to support our professional learning for our staff with additional time and additional personnel. And that recommendation was echoed by our administrative team and the feedback we received from our teachers. So then our math committee is focused right now on researching and evaluating potential new core resources. We actually have vendors coming in on March 6th to give us some initial presentations on what products may be out there after spending quite a bit of time researching what other districts around us and even not so close to us have adopted and used most recently for core math instruction. Amidst that work, we're also making sure that the committee is developing sort of a, a best practice guidance document. What do we want mathematics instruction to look like in District 58? And then what resources can we find that will support that vision for highest quality math instruction? So that's the current work of our math committee. Our English Language Arts Committee, as most of you are aware, we're in the first full year, the second year of implementation, but the first year that our new ELA resources are implemented district-wide. And so our committee work at this point focuses on looking at how that experience has been going for our teachers, for our students. What's the level of fidelity of implementation across the district? How can we continue to support and enhance our support for our teachers? And so this group at our last meeting took a look at a lot of feedback we've gotten from teachers around what's going well with Benchmark and StudySync. What are our continued challenges and what can the committee do to provide additional support going forward? Because one of the things we need to recognize with all of these curricula rolling out is that once we've implemented or once we've adopted a resource, the professional learning and the support isn't over. That continues and is ongoing to ensure that that implementation is successful for continuous years. So right now, we're focusing on writing grammar and vocabulary instruction and working to, to bring those experiences aligned consistently across the district for students, utilizing our new resources, and identifying potential places where we may need to supplement those resources, either with committee-created materials or potentially with some other supplemental materials. Our Social Studies Committee, as we said, is not in the pursuit of resources right at this time. Instead, they're building further background on the new Social Studies Learning Standards and really what that instructional shift, what's known as the C3 framework, is going to mean for our teachers and for our students. And we spent some time at our last meeting actually taking a crosswalk, comparing the new NGSS three-dimensional learning model with the new Social Studies uh, C3 framework. And what we found is that there's just a tremendous amount of crossover between the instructional strategies that are asked for by each. So that really will be a benefit to us as we go through professional learning around science. What we learn in, in, in science instruction with that three-dimensional learning will relate directly in many ways to what we will then implement with social studies. And so we're continuing to explore all of that inquiry-based learning to, to build further committee background and kind of reactivate some of our knowledge around questioning and what quality questioning looks like in the classroom. And again, eventually working toward further resource exploration. Our middle school health committee 
um, has implemented this year, as you, we talked about in October at the curriculum workshop, year one of a two-year middle school health curriculum. And so this year, the committee is continuing to meet, reflecting on the experience of that implementation, talking about the lessons we've developed and working to revise those, and also working to finish the authoring of year two, so that by the end of this school year, we have the second year ready to go so that our seventh and eighth graders will experience that second year, or I should say our current sixth and seventh graders will experience that second year of the curriculum uh, in the beginning and fall of 2019. Our biliteracy committee is continuing to build background around best practice in what is really more commonly known throughout our area as dual language instruction. They, they mean essentially the same thing, but you, you may hear the terms dual language more and more often, and that's really what our biliteracy program does. We've spent a lot of time reviewing the current offerings and really looking at what are exemplars in other districts, what does research tell us about this instruction, who are we serving with this program, and are there, are there students that we are perhaps missing the opportunity to serve? And one of the, the committee's um, goals is to do some initial exploration around the possibilities of turning our program, which is currently a one-way dual language program, meaning it is only available to students whose native language is Spanish, into a two-way dual language program, which would mean it would be available to students whose native language is English and whose students' native language is Spanish. That would require a lot of research, a lot of work, and, and a lot of thought around a district with our demographic makeup. But when you dig into the research, there is a lot of support and there are a lot of models around us that have done a really amazing job with this. So it's something we're going to begin looking into. Um, I would anticipate that committee bringing back a further report sometime around this time next year with the findings of Our social emotional learning audit committee, named a little bit differently because this committee wasn't necessarily designed to do a complete overhaul of our social emotional learning curriculum, but to ensure fidelity of implementation and to take a look at where we are and where there might be some gaps and some needs in terms of social emotional learning instruction in the district. And so at this point, that's exactly what we're doing reviewing and kind of refining that scope and sequence. We know that we use second step as our curriculum, but trying to ensure that we have, that everything is covered throughout the course of the year and that there we aren't um, identifying gaps in instruction over the course of many years. We're also taking a look at, at tier one assessments of social emotional learning skills. So in the same way that our math assessments, for example, give us a, a district level or a program level read on how well we might be doing with math instruction and reading instruction over a period of time. A tier one social emotional learning assessment would give us an idea of how well we're doing with instruction in the social emotional competencies for our children. It's something that we talk about and, and do often, but we, we don't often measure it in a quantifiable way. So that's something we're looking at. It's, it's something that is, um, there are many possibilities and ways to approach that. So our committee has just begun looking into possibilities of experiencing some of those assessments and seeing what types of information we might gain and how we might be able to put that into practice in terms of assessing our overall social emotional learning program. Our elementary art curriculum is not, it, it's functioning as a committee, although it's really a committee of four because we have four elementary art teachers right now. Um, and they've been doing work for the past couple of years, uh, continuing to align instruction to the, the not, I guess, so new anymore, Illinois Arts and Learning Standards. They've been in place for a couple of years now. And you may recall that last year, we expanded to weekly art in grades one and two. Our intent is to move forward in the coming school year for weekly art lessons for students in grades K through six, beginning in fall of 2019. This will align with the amount of instructional minutes we have for music in K through six. We're moving to 30 minute lessons rather than the current 40 minute bi-weekly lessons, which is a significant increase as we go forward. It also requires a slightly different shift in instructional approach because it is 10 minutes less of instruction than our teachers have been used to as they prepared lessons and presented lessons. And so one of the things we'll be doing is looking at how do we realign or re, uh, readdress that instruction so that we don't lose the time for students to be creative and hands-on and experiencing, but also knowing that we will have a, just a little bit less time in those lessons. So not only are we thinking about just the difference in time, but we're also working, we brought some, some really high quality consultants in to work with our art instructors, and we're thinking about realigning the way we approach instruction, more, even more so aligned with those new Illinois Arts Learning Standards. So thinking about the essential questions and thinking about the process of art as opposed to simply what we'll create at the end of it, but really focusing on that process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we look at some of the um, art curricula in the, 
uh, middle school exploratories. So this is, a, this is something that we're excited about. It's something that we've heard from our community for many years. We, we would like to see an increase in art minutes from for K-6, and so we're excited to be able to bring that forward. Our middle school exploratory committee is at about is at the almost the end of a two-year process to review and develop our exploratory classes for students in grades seven and eight. We've done surveys of students and staff. We've partnered with District 99. We've had representatives from District 99 at actually many of these committee meetings that I've been talking about. But this one in particular, we've had very specific partnerships with people who teach or are department chairmen of the courses, the, the types of courses we are trying to design here at uh, our middle schools. And so the courses are written for specific lengths. We've moved to trimesters in the middle school, but to reduce these courses to a trimester frame would actually reduce the amount of offerings that we would have for our students. So we're continuing to compose the exploratory courses, not necessarily in the trimester framework, but in the appropriate amount of weeks as we go through. It makes reporting a little jagged, but other than that, it doesn't have an impact on schedule or anything that's, that's, that's not working well already this year. So that, that allows us to continue to expand our offerings for 7th and 8th graders in exploratory. Our 7th grade program will look similar to what it has been. It begins with a class called Connections. This is really designed sort of as an introduction to middle school course. Um, what's different about it is we're changing the length from a full nine weeks to a 15-day introductory course. And within that 15 days, we'll still have focus on study skills and time management. Different, um, different district, district staff will come in to present on topics and help students know what resources are available to them, where to seek help if they need it, those kinds of things. And then rather than trying to front load all of those kinds of experiences, we've embedded what we're calling reconnections into the subsequent three classes that the students will take. So rather than having those things happen all at once, we'll be able to revisit some of those essential skills for success in school and connections to the resources in school over the course of the year. Our seventh graders will continue to have art as they have. It will be a slightly longer course as a result of the connections um, shift. And you can see on the screen some of the different units of study. These are similar to what our students are currently experiencing in seventh grade art. We'll continue to offer music for seventh graders, for all seventh graders. And one of the exciting things here is that we're really working with all of these classes on unifying the experience across the two middle schools. And so we're focusing on a combination in the music class of hands-on with actual instruments, as well as digital composition and technology using a number of really exciting programs that help students to compose and create um, without any instrumental knowledge at all. And again, that connections, reconnection will happen there. Our seventh graders will also continue to have family consumer science. That's, again, about a 10 and a half week course. And in the seventh grade version of that, we'll cover some interior design with that 3D design, so incorporating some of the technology into those classes, and also some of the same basic skills that are still essential for students to be able to know how to prepare themselves a snack when they get home from school. Our eighth grade program has two completely new courses to it um, with this redesign. So in eighth grade, we are now offering an art class as part of the exploratory sequence. And this will focus a little bit more on some media and some digital experiences that we haven't previously had a focus on in our middle school curriculum. And again, you'll see under the first one, after photography, one of those essential questions coming out of the standards is how do images in media influence our view of the world? So rather than simply learning about how to take pictures and what a quality composition of a picture is, we'll really start talking about what that process entails and the different elements of using photography to make a statement beyond just capturing something in, in nature or in still, in still life. And those kinds of questions will continue through the different art modes. So you can again see a number of animation and other types of things that will be offered in that course. We'll continue to offer our foreign language exploratory course, which gives exploration and appreciation of three unique languages and really is designed in the truest nature of the word exploratory. It, it's not an in-depth exploration. It's about three weeks per language, but it gives students a sampling of the culture, the, the types of, of speech, and, and the types of experiences that each language may yield so that it can help to inform a choice when they get into high school. We'll continue with a, an eighth grade family and consumer science offering, which we've currently had, um, focusing on child development, consumer education, and the culminating project, which currently happens um, at O'Neill, but does not currently happen at Herrick, but will next year, is a student-run cafe. So an actual functioning system in which students are using the skills they're learning in this class to be able to offer items for sale to their peers. So it's a, it's a real-life application that actually will run throughout the course of the year after students have taken this course. 
The other course that we're excited to present that's redesigned, we're calling STEAM Studio. So STEAM is an acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Music. And this really will have a focus on the engineering design process. It's going to incorporate a, a lot of student choice, a lot of hands-on, a lot of technology. And this is one place within the exploratory curriculum where we'll be bringing back a proposal to, to spend a little bit of money on an actual program. There's a really exciting program designed uh, through Northwestern University that our team has they researched several options, and this is something that we're really excited to enhance uh, the, the experience for our students. It comes with a lot of setup materials. There's 3D printers and things like that involved, so that's some of the initial investment. It won't be a recurring expense to that level, but we'll be excited to tell you more about the specific program at a subsequent meeting. So then our exploratory committee is continuing to, to really finalize the actual class, the actual um, lessons and days of class that come with those overall course descriptions. For our current seventh graders, what will happen uh, shortly is that families will receive an email that will notify them about these new exploratory offerings, because there are some significant differences in what we've been offering, and also notify them about our full year foreign language program, which is offered in Spanish or in French. Something a little different this year that we are going to present to families is that any of those options will be available to all incoming graders. There is a criteria that exists for our, for our full year foreign language program that really does describe the profile of a student who is most likely to find success in that program. And, and that has to do with academic achievement as well as some of those demonstration of, of learner behaviors and, and the way we approach uh, learning. Because it is a rigorous course, it's a fast paced class, it's a high school class that we actually end up teaching in less time, and it does yield high school proficiency credit. So we want it, however, we also know that we want that offering to be available to those students whose families feel they will be successful in it. So we're re refining the process for um, entry into that program, and families will receive information about that. We also, again, wanted to put that alongside these new exploratory offerings so that everybody has a full awareness of what that class period could look like for them as an eighth grader beginning next year. So that takes us through our committee updates. For the board, I'll pause there for a minute and see if there are any questions around that first set of slides before we move into um, in our assessment today. Can I ask a question? Yes. When we think about each of these committees and their charge, what they're asked to go explore and resources that are asked to explore, do we typically find that curriculum is also often paired with a progress monitoring tool, or is that a separate discussion, a separate research topic? That's a good question. Um, you know, the progress monitoring of an overall district-wide implementation is going to happen in a few different ways. It's going to happen through continuing to, to review our, our, our assessment data over time. It's also going to be looking at the actual, the actual assessments that come within many of the programs. So benchmark for decide to make uh, district-wide top assessments. We have that in that program. We have certain assessments that each student at each grade level takes each year. And then we're able to sort of programmatically as a district take a look at what those trend lines look like over time. A specific progress monitoring tool typically isn't included with a resource adoption, but at least part of it's the, the committee conversation in terms of how do we know that we're doing well with this, and that's part of the economy that happens on the campus. It's also one of the things They have those conversations. We're working to outline the steps so that the ways we will assess the effectiveness of these new resources or of a new curricular uh, approach or a new instructional approach will be identified throughout the course of the process. It's, typically, it's going to be something we are going to have to decide internally as a district, but it is something that's part of the conversation. Okay? Okay. All Thank right. You. So map data, we know there, there's two different ways to, that we look at map data. One is to look at the achievement side of the data, which is essentially we're looking at that moment in time, what's happening right now, and that helps us to make some in-the-moment instructional decisions based on what we're seeing in this moment and maybe as it relates to the past couple of data points that we have. And then we also look at maps to tell us about growth, to look at how our individual students are doing over time compared to where we hope they'd be, and also by grade level, by class, by school. It also can help us with goal setting. 
The next several slides on the presentation are captured in the handout that was at the door. So I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna move, these are here for reference so that if you're looking at the presentation, you can come back to them. But they're also on the presentation sheet that you all had. I'm going to explain these as we look at the actual data. So I want to keep them in the presentation for reference. Um, the one thing I do want to highlight though before we get into this winter's map data is that there was a shift in when we administered the winter benchmark. Previously, we have always done the winter map benchmarking in January, starting usually the second day after winter break, continuing for a three week period. This year, we elected to do that winter benchmarking in December, so it was December 3rd through 21st of this year. The reasons behind that were many. There were a lot of conversations with, with our administrative team. One of the things that some of our, our teachers and principals observed last spring was a sense of assessment fatigue by the time we came through MAP and, and had PARC prior to that. And so we talked about just putting a little bit more space between some of these assessments. One of the other things that we realized that we knew was happening is that we were moving toward parent-teacher conferences happening during what would have been that January benchmarking window. And so this allowed us to have that process completed prior to those conferences to have that information in parents' hands and some another piece of information going into those conferences. It's, it's a decision that we knew would have some sort of an impact on our data. We're, we're not surprised to see the numbers looking a little bit different. That was part of the conversation. Certain measures take into account the, the interval of instruction. Others do not. And so as we look at the winter data for this year, we have to take all of that into account as we review it. So the, the short version of that is this year's winter data is not exactly comparable to prior year's winter data in all cases. And so it's something that we'll need to continue to look at over time. So if we look at a moment in time for reading, this chart shows uh, where we are right now. I, we put the fall and winter uh, percentiles next to each other. So we can just look from where we started this fall to where we are right now both the mean, far left, so the average of the scores, and the median, a little bit further to the right, those both measures of central tendency. They're similar but not same, as you'll see, because outliers in either direction can have a different impact on those two measures. So um, as we look across, in most cases, we're seeing growth or, very, or, or a couple of slight declines in terms of where that median percentile is. But if we look to the um, achievement for some series, we look at the achievement percentile here, so let me back up one second. So here are our median percentiles, and then here is our achievement percentile. As a reminder, that achievement percentile tells me how a grade level is doing compared to all of the other grade levels or schools that took the MAP assessment with the same interval of instruction, the same amount of time between testing periods. So our median percentile, and, and again, remember that MAP is normed at 50, and so anything above 50 is something to celebrate. Typically, we say once we start to approach the 70th percentile, we're really looking at high performance. That's the mark of a high performing district. And that's what that achievement percentile starts to tell us. We're still, as you know, compared to the other schools that have had that similar window of time, we are we're seeing ourselves on the high end of all of those achievement percentiles. The, the blue section looks at the growth measures. So the white are the achievement, again, and the blue are the growth measures. So as we look down the number of students who met or exceeded their projection, that's the percentage of students who went, who met or went beyond what MAP predicted they would be able to do based solely on their starting point. That OPP, the out of points possible statistic, looks at all of the possible points to be gained by the cohort. So for our third graders, for example, out of 100, if 100 points would mean an average period of growth, 138 means they are they have gained 38% or 38% more growth than would be typical. And then that school conditional growth percentile is similar to the student achievement percentile in that it looks at um, our overall uh, growth compared to schools or grade levels that have the same interval of instruction between fall and winter. Looking a little bit more specific. And this is where we have to be careful with, again, how we interpret this data. So I'm gonna look right at those, those bright green numbers. So our, our kindergarten cohorts in the winter, uh, is it well, you can see the green. So in the winter of, of 18, that group was at the 78th percentile. That was their median percentile. And then we look, if we follow that cohort diagonally, so those same students who are now in first grade, we see a 69th median percentile, which at first glance is alarming. That seems like a drop. 
One of the things we have to remember is that many have additional weeks of instruction, additional exposure to material in January versus December. So this is the, the median at that point in time. But then if we look at that percentile, the same group, their achievement percentile, again, their scores compared to all of the other uh, students who took the same assessment in the same period of time, was at the 96th in last year's measure, and is at the 93rd this year. So is it a decline? It's a slight decline in that measure as well, but it doesn't look as drastic as that 78th to 69th does right off the bat. So this is one of the things with map data that we have to, we're, we're looking truly for trends over time as we go through. And as we look um, across horizontally, we'll see that there are, generally speaking, we're in similar places. That first grade in winter of 18 was an anomaly all year long. Those are some of the highest scores we've ever seen. We talked about that last year. The other thing that, that's good to look at is if you just if you look vertically, as we descend, we start to see higher median percentiles, generally speaking, the longer students have been in our system, the higher the grades get. And that tells us that what we're doing as a district is working. We'll move through, um, that was the achievement percentile. Again, this just sort of tracks cohorts in terms of students meeting and exceeding their targets as we look you know, from the last couple of years going across horizontally. Similar, a couple of areas of, of slight decline, a couple of areas of slight growth. So again, looking to see those patterns says that we're still seeing a large number of our students, a, a much higher than average percentage of our students who are meeting those targets. This one again looks at how much overall growth in a period of time. So if 100 points was an average amount of growth, then when we see numbers like our sixth graders at 178, that says that they're basically 70% higher growth than almost, or almost three quarters of a, of a year more growth on track at this point. And then finally, that school conditional growth percentile. So where is our growth at compared to the other uh, schools and grade levels that have taken the assessment in the same amount of time? One of the questions that does come up is, how has benchmark and study sync influenced these numbers? Do we think that at this point we can say, because of benchmark, we are seeing some things? And the answer to that is not really yet. It's too soon to try to make a causal relationship between the implementation of a new resource when we really, two thirds of our teachers, by the time of this assessment, had only spent three and a half months embedded in the instruction of that resource. I think if you ask those teachers at that moment in time, or even perhaps at this moment in time, they would say, we like it, we're working really hard, are we as comfortable with it as we want to be? Not yet, because that's what takes time, professional learning and implementation. So in the same way that, that it, it's, it's just a little early to try to say, because we have benchmark, we're seeing one thing or another. Over the course of the next couple of years, absolutely, we we'll want to be watching for those trends and expecting to see some positive growth in all areas as a result of that implementation. Similarly with math, we can take a look at those same numbers. And again, when we look at the, the median percentiles and the mean percentiles, we're seeing, again, some growth in some areas, a couple of slight percentage point declines here or there, some actually within a margin of error. As we look over on the growth side of things, these numbers are not as high as they are on the reading side for us. And that's been true over the past couple of years. That's something we have, we have looked at, we have acknowledged, it's, it's frankly, part of the impetus of our math committee taking the steps that it's taking to really take a look at you know, where is our, what are we able to challenge our students with from a resource perspective. However, this is still high performing numbers. When you start high, growth is more challenging to achieve sometimes. Again, nothing below the national average, nothing, nothing that is of concern, but compared to our reading numbers, we're not necessarily capturing as much growth across the board as we might want to see. So it's something to continue to pursue, and that's part of last year looking at some of our, our blueprint revisions and the work that our math committee has done. We're continuing to, to work in the, you know, in, in the interim while we are looking toward new resources, and we continue to be proud of what we're seeing. We just know that we, there are, there's room for improvement always on a chart like this. Again, just to walk through some of these. Same concept if we look, again, we can take that green number. If you track that cohort down, that, is, that descent from 80th percentile in their kindergarten year to 69th percentile in their first grade year could start to seem alarming. But when we look again at that achievement percentile based on the other school, other students who have taken that assessment in the same amount of time, we see that it's not as big a discrepancy. Math in particular is linear. So we know that the map assessment looks for knowledge of additional content to move you up that bit scale. That's one of the things that the assessment wants. 
three, four weeks of instructional difference can have an impact on things like that. Can we, can we say that definitively? No, because it's the first time we've taken the assessment in December, but it's something that as we look for trends over time, we'll want to be aware of. Looking again at our percentage of students who are meeting and exceeding their expectations, everything well over 50, some in the 60s, and a, and a high group in first grade, kind of consistently over the past few years. We look at, again, that total points possible, and we're seeing everybody, again, solidly above the average, with a few people gaining about almost another half year worth of instruction in our sixth and seventh grades, and also our first grade. And then finally, that school growth percentile, so our growth compared to other places. We're actually seeing increases almost everywhere, or almost everywhere, as compared to last year, or similar places. And some of the, the particular valleys that we observed last year at this time in third and fourth and fifth grade, when you look at those numbers this year, we see that those have increased significantly from last year. Can I say that that's exactly because our math committee took this information and that their very next meeting a year ago really looked at the, at the resources that were available and tried to make some improvements? I think that certainly factors in. I think that's, one, that's a good example of, we looked at those numbers last year at this meeting and said, that's something we need to take a look at. And our math committee members spent time in the spring and over the summer seeking additional resources in some of the areas they found gaps. And so we're seeing an increase as a result of that. So that takes us through math data. The last piece of assessment I'll talk about is the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. This replaces PARC as our statewide mandated assessments for students in grades three through eight. Now, what's funny is that it's replacing Park by name, but in truth, we're, it's going to be administered again by Pearson, who is the same company that's administrated Park for the past several years, based on a protest that was leveled against ISBE because of their bidding process. It's also going to utilize the Park questions, and that would have been true whomever um, administered the test. The, the Park questions are the Park questions are actually owned by a third party. So we have one company who will eventually administer the assessment, Pearson, who will currently administer it and then a third company who owns the questions that the state leases for this assessment. And the truth is, using those same questions from the state's perspective is a good idea because it allows them to compare growth over time without making a drastic shift in the assessment. Um, the good news is that it is slightly shorter overall for our students, so that will help us recapture some instructional time there. We also um, have five of our schools who have been selected for field testing for new questions. So for those schools, it will be Slightly shorter, but a little less slightly shorter because they will take one additional um, assessment as mandated by the state to look at some of the new questions that are there. Again, in terms of that similarity, the, 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 the materials, the platform, we're really being instructed to use park practice materials, which is good for us from a student exposure standpoint because that's exactly what our, our students have been used to. Our approach will be the same, almost exactly sequentially as it was last year. We'll send out notification to all of our families uh, next week sometime, letting them know that the assessment will be coming in April, giving them some background information, and letting them know that their, their, their children may see some exposure to that testing platform and to some of the sample questions. Not a sit down and take a whole sample assessment, but working through the assessment platform so that it's not unfamiliar to the kids, so that they're prepared as best they can to approach the assessment. Continuing that idea that we want to approach this with our best effort, just as we do everything else. No more, no less. It's an assessment that we, we do value, and it's something that we want to make sure that we're all focusing on with the same positive energy we do math or a classroom assessment or anything else. That window will be right after spring break, and we have uh, we're building out our internal district website that helps all of our teachers to get to all of those resources. So I'll pause there again after the, the data and assessment portion for the board and ask if there are any things I can clarify. Is, is it our plan to continue with the December testing window then going forward? Uh, we honestly, we haven't had a, a conversation around that at this point. I think that the timing of the, the parent-teacher conferences help, makes that a, a, a smart choice, but it, it will be a, a team decision that we'll talk about. Again, I think that when you, when you make a change to be able to look at what it means in terms of the over time, it's sometimes helpful also to continue with that. But ultimately, like, we haven't made that decision yet for, um, for the coming school year. It's a local decision, so we can, really, we can make it at just about any time. Um, Justin, when I, when I first looked at the data, obviously um, it wasn't what I was hoping to see, but, um, and I understand the, moving with the window from January to December. Um, so I'm optimistic that it, by when we do the, the spring assessment that we will see 
more growth between winter and spring than we usually would, and, and things will, hopefully things will kind of auto-correct. Um, however, talk to me about steps being taken to um, analyze the data, draw assumptions, make inferences, and um, target areas where we, need, where we have needs and make sure that we are not just crossing our fingers, but implementing strategies to make sure that our, we, are, we have that correction that we're hoping to get. Sure. Um, I can tell you that our, our individual principals had much the same reaction when the winter data came through. It's, it's not, last year our winter data was, was much higher than this is, and so that's just something we do, we do have to acknowledge. Um, we're, in the same way that we're looking kind of programmatically from this level, we, we are looking at where are some of those pockets. You know, while, while I said that the benchmark isn't, it's too soon to make causal connections, we can start to make some initial um, looking into which are our relative areas of strength and weakness. Are we, are we stronger on the informational kind of text side of things or the literature side of things? And so that's, that's work that individual buildings can do. It's work that we can do broadly as an administrative team. Our math um, data, similar to what we've done before, we, we will take a look at that with math committee and also look at the blueprint corrections and adjustments we've made thus far and just try to see are there other gaps that we're seeing uh, on, a, on a broad scale. That's really, that's really the best we can do with, with the, the winter data that is, again, kind of separate from what we've seen. We can look at some of those trends and look for places that there are, are, are considerable differences and try to, try to see what we might be able to do in terms of, again, are we enhancing some resources, knowing that we're headed hopefully toward a new core resource in a couple of years? Are there places, and again, that's where I, we saw some of that growth in those third, fourth, and fifth grade Areas we really did. I mean, the teachers who were on, who were at the, on those grade levels in the math committee spent probably an additional 12 hours researching and looking for additional resources, refining some of the blueprint instructions, and so I think those are the kinds of, of mid-course corrective measures we can make when we see things. Have we heard any changes from IASB, or do we expect there to be the same sort of assumptions in terms of minimum requirements for? taking the test and the way the calculations are going to be done again this year. You're talking about the 95% participation. Mm -hmm. All of that is, that's actually in the ESSA legislation. So okay. that, that, that will not change unless it changes legislatively. Okay. Or if it's not, then we probably should be investing in it, but are part of the show going to be around the curriculum? Are there other hypotheses around what else around math as a district we can do to either invest more or change approach. What are things that, we, that come to mind from that math committee around things beyond curriculum? So I, I, won't, I won't posit it as a hypothesis to why the data is where it is necessarily, because we haven't, we haven't connected those two conversations specifically, but the kinds of things that the math committee uh, regularly urges us to remember and has really worked on is that professional learning, is ensuring that in the same way, you know, balanced literacy instruction is pretty widely known We've spent a lot of time in our district talking about the components of balanced literacy, having, having guided reading, having shared reading, making sure we're instructing on all of the components of, of literacy, we're instructing on vocabulary, we're looking at all of those components. In math, we have spent some time on professional learning around those things, but we have, you know, we've, we've dug into math talks, and you'll see that happening in many um, places across the district, but we haven't spent the same time recently focusing on what are some of those standards of mathematical practice. Now I should say our committee has most recently and is spending some time on that and so that's a place where we're continuing to enhance and ensure that we have that we have discussed and have, have given teachers the time and space to really dig into what those practices are and ways they can bring them into their classroom. A couple of years ago we had a partnership with um, the MCMI, the Metro Chicago Mathematical Institute. Did I do that right? Close initiative. Okay, and um, and that was a you know that was a, a way that we brought some of that professional learning into the district. We're working to, to continue to enhance that. But it, again, we're, we're we have been working with finite time to some degree, and so that's where we're excited about being able to see continuous improvement as as we go forward. So that's another it's another thing we're doing. Certainly, I, again, I, I'm not ready to say it's causal, but it's another piece of, of the puzzle how we can ensure that our kids are getting what they need mathematically. All right, the next portion of our presentation is going to talk about our professional learning plan. I'm gonna ask Jane Dentist to start us off. All right, as you know, um, we talked to them at our February 11th meeting about our recommendation for professional learning for next year. Um, 
and we, we talked really about the identification of professional learning as a priority, as a need, a very high priority need to support our staff. And, you know, this is a, a need that we've heard from our teachers at the building level as well as through our committee work, through our councils, through our administrative team, that we need more time for our professional learning to support our staff if we are going to be effective and um, successful in curricular implementation in improving our professional practice, really making sure that we are providing the highest quality experience for our students. So at the February 11th board meeting, we spoke about our recommendation, um, which is again here, the early release days every Monday, releasing at two o'clock. This would allow that 90 minutes of consistent professional learning for all of our K-8 staff. Preschool, uh, while we have the same goal, it would look a little bit different. We're working on that plan, and that the reason for that is the programming for preschool would have AM and PM sessions. Um, okay, that's just, thank you. Since that February 11th meeting, we have continued these conversations and facilitated sessions with our specialists, meaning art, music, PE teachers, um, the related service provider, social workers, like what's... Um, how would we structure this time to really make sure we maximize the benefit? We've continued discussions at our curriculum council. Um, last week with our board, uh, the executive board for our teachers union, along with two board members in our ASC administrative team. And then taken feedback from the various groups, taken feedback and questions from our board, as well as from parents who have reached out to try to put together some more additional information to talk about tonight. So I think um, Carrie is going to share our next few slides. So we reached out uh, really to all the districts throughout DuPage County and received um, some specific information back and in, in, in particular we were targeting districts that had um, implemented either with success or challenge a late start or early release model within their within their district. And so what we were hoping to do is identify um, some of the supports that those districts um, found really successful um, that helped to support families during the transition, but also just simply help to ensure a smooth transition to a, a late starter and early dismissal. And then we also were looking for where did challenges exist and where you implemented um, plans and, and really trying to identify some things that we should try to either avoid or know ahead of time to address. And so much of this information has helped to inform some of the other um, exploration that we've done. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but just to point out a couple of things. First of all, communication consistently was mentioned. Um, making sure that we are communicating the change and identifying some of the challenges that we know may exist within our community and trying to address those as early. Um, as we possibly can. It was interesting to hear that consistency in day and time is helpful. This is something that we spent a lot of time debating about as a team, um, whether we should go, whether we should look at um, an every Monday approach, if we should look at every other Monday or once a month kind of an approach. And one of the things that we heard consistently from other districts was the, the more often you create a change in that schedule, the more it was challenging for faculty and for families. That predictability and schedule is something that um, other districts really found was helpful. So um, going with um, a two o'clock early dismissal seems like it aligns a little better with a smoother implementation rather than um, some districts have done a half day or a, a, like almost like a quarter day dismissal. And um, in those places, then they stagger it out a little bit more and find that um, it can be confusing and less productive time for faculty and for um, for families. Connecting with child care providers, we have some more information about that later in today's presentation, but that's certainly important. Um, making sure that we're communicating not only to our faculty and staff, but also to our families about the rationale um, in what we're doing with that time and that we're in an ongoing way evaluating that. That's something that we talked about at the last board meeting, but we've refined some of our thinking in that regard as well. Um, Effective communication, and this really would come into play even more if we were staggering the days. Um, so if you're going to have one Monday that it's early dismissal, the next Monday it's not, making sure that you're really um, noting that in every single communication that's going out to families. 
Um, and then finally, and what's really important to us at this point, um, that feedback and connecting with our community is really, really important, making sure that our efforts are aligning um, at every school and across our district um, and with our district initiatives as well. So incorporating those feedback loops, a couple of districts mentioned that, and that was something that we were really keying into already as well. So we thought that that was important and noteworthy that some of the other districts um, experienced some challenges when they didn't have those loops in place. And once they were able to put them in place, it really was helpful. Um, some of the challenges, again, I mentioned that rotating of schedule really presented a challenge. Um, there was a district that said that they tried to offer some in-district special child care programs. Um, and what they found is the utilization was really low and after the first two years ended up discontinuing that. So we thought that that was noteworthy. Um, many districts again acknowledge that partnering with their local providers they were able to come up with a schedule that seemed like it would work and, and we've had some success with that as well. Um, there was an impact for a couple of different districts on shared busing so we felt good to know that we had already started to think about that and planned around that but there continues to be some work that we need to do there and, and really folding that into the consideration is is critical and then finally communication with and buy-in from all of our teachers and staff is really critical um, we know that this is time that is being shifted from time that teachers would otherwise have from with students and so we want to make sure that this is really valuable time for our faculty um, and for our staff and everyone can communicate about that and so um, our ongoing discussions with each of our teachers and staff members is really important to our success as we implement this what, what I did think was especially noteworthy is every single district, no matter how they implemented it and the challenges that they faced along the way, and some certainly had greater success than others, but every single district said that the time was incredibly valuable. Um, it provides really critical time for collaboration, that professional learning, curriculum development and implementation, grade level planning, and so um, that we thought was noteworthy as well. Um, I mentioned child care options um, early on this school year we started kind of reaching out to to see what options might exist whether we thought about a late start an early release or maybe some more half days remember all those different models that we were looking at um, now that we have a proposal that um, we are hoping uh, to pursue we reached out to each of the child care um, providers in our area that we're aware of we talked with our principals about the child care providers they're aware of in each of their schools. And so we reached out to each of these providers. Each one um, acknowledged and, and confirmed that they could accommodate a 2 p.m. Monday release for the 1920 school year. So we're really happy to have those partnerships. And we know that um, Champions is available within our schools, but many families, for any number of reasons, choose to um, use other providers. And so we were really pleased that um, so many of our local organizations were able to accommodate that um, we have not spoken with any who have said that they can't accommodate um, that 2 p.m. dismissal um, and we've received some anecdotal feedback from families who are working that that consistency may be helpful the fact that it's a 2 p.m. dismissal as opposed to half days um, might be a little easier for some of our working families to um, accommodate as well so um, there's some positive news there as well as we dug into this a little bit further Okay, one of the other questions that we received was related to our specials and what is that impact on the art, music, and PE. Um, in our model, such as this year when we have half days, the students just don't receive instruction in those areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the benefits that we see with this consistency of scheduling with the Every Monday is our students will receive the same amount of instructional time, weekly music, weekly art, now K-6, so weekly PE and library. And that consistency allows that to happen uh, even on those early release days. So it would be scheduled out so students aren't missing um, the beneficial time in, in the instruction in those areas. Additionally, um, we think it's important and beneficial for the teachers of those classes to also, they would then have the opportunity for that targeted professional learning. Another question um, that came to us, or a comment was, you know, what is this going to mean for our substitute usage, our sub costs? We are being very conservative and cautious, if you will, not to overpromise in this area, but we absolutely know at the very least we will reduce one of those, the K-6 grade level half days. That's three hours of instruction. The students will have 
back with their teacher as opposed to time with a substitute, as well as the, the benefit of the savings, the, that's $10,000 for each of those half days. Um, we feel we re will realize more savings. However, again, we want to look at saving the reduction of our middle school exploratory committee meetings. The work that the, that committee was going to do can occur during the early release time. We, again, not wanting to overpromise, we feel that there are going to be some other reductions in some of the work, um, whether it's committee work, student data progress monitoring meetings that we right now in some of our buildings need to use substitutes to accomplish, additional teacher meetings, possibly freeing up some of that time before and after school as we try to fit in more meetings, or in the buildings that again, we need to access the use of substitutes. So we'll have a much better sense, but this is at, at least, um, at the very minimum, the impact that we view and the benefits that we see in reducing our time with substitutes. Another question, obviously, which is very important, is about the impact on instructional time. The er early release, if we left everything else as is, would definitely impact our instructional time. It would decrease our instructional time. What we are proposing with the early release Mondays is that addition of 10 minutes to the instructional day in grades K-6. Um, through that, we actually will be capturing a net gain in instructional time over the course of the year. And we feel that's beneficial you know, in these last few years as we've increased, well, just even the art for next year, we've increased the PE instruction. We have the weekly social emotional learning lessons. We feel that that is a benefit that we want to realize. So even with the early release, again, adding that, let's say it's five minutes on the start and five minutes at the end of the day, um, we'll have a net gain in instructional time. The middle school scheduling is definitely more complex. We've begun those conversations. Um, at this point, we're considering adding five minutes to maintain that consistency of the schedule. But what we need to work more with the teachers, with a small group of teachers and administrators to consider that overall impact, what the schedule would look like. Um, if you have a middle school student, you know they have right now on Wednesdays, they have power, which is their um, um, time for reading is also time for SEL instruction. So our conversations are about moving maybe potentially that power day, the SEL instruction to the Monday, and then reworking what that schedule would mean for the rest of the, the classes on that day. So there's more work to come in that area. And I believe Justin. Thank you. So perhaps the, the strongest question that came out of, of last, uh, the, our presentation two weeks ago is what is this gonna look like? What are we actually gonna do with the time? And, and what's the impact gonna be for teaching and learning throughout the district. So what's on the screen now is a, is a, a sample schedule, which, or maybe a draft schedule, we're not gonna set it in stone yet, but of what the, the first several weeks could look like. So you'll notice that um, the first two Mondays that we're in school, we've labeled building directed professional learning, and then September 16th and 23rd, we're sort of splitting. Those north side schools would be district-directed professional learning, and south side would be teacher-directed, and then it flips the next week. And then it kind of goes on through the schedule like that. You'll remember those are the three sort of major uh, areas that we talked about this being used for. So that just kind of gives an idea of what the first several weeks might look like and what that breakdown could look like based somewhat on some specific things that are happening. So to talk a little more, bit more about what each of those are. Those first two Mondays that would be building directed, again, this means that the, the professional learning experiences would be guided by the building administration. In those first couple of weeks of school, we, we as teachers have all of these new students in front of us, we have new information, get this chance in those first couple of Mondays to work as grade level teams or cross grade level teams to talk about the student data we have, the early observations we have, to do some of that instructional planning across departments at the middle school and really think about how are we going to differentiate this year right now for the students in front of us so that we can, we can make that happen. Also talking about how are we communicating with families? How are we as a grade level team going to do that based on this particular population? population we have this year. The, the outcome there is we're able to implement some of those things within the second or third week of school because we have that targeted time to really dig into those, those pieces. Our teachers are eager to do it, and it's not that they aren't already spending the time, but it's having everyone in place who works together to support that grade level team on those Mondays to really make those decisions earlier in the school year and, and have a, a, a sooner and more immediate impact for our students. So those first couple of days would be those building directed days, theoretically. 
then what would the district direct directed days look like? There's a couple different versions here. One thing we know is that we have new science resources coming in next year. We have a, 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 a tremendous instructional shift in the way we're going to teach science next year. So in those first district directed days, for all of our K-6 teachers who are teaching science and then for our middle school science teachers, this is a chance to, to, to pause and reflect on, er, on implementation very early in the process. Are there things that are going well? Are there places we need support? We can work, I can work with other second grade teachers to say, have you tried this? Have you found this struggle? How is the technology component working? How is the online platform working for us? Are there other ways we can support each other? Or are there questions we need to reach out early to our vendors or our tech team for support? Before we're, we're six weeks, seven weeks, months into instruction, we have a chance to really make sure that that, that fidelity of implementation begins right away and our teachers have time to reflect on and share and learn from each other in those experiences as well as our curriculum department and our instructional coaches and all of the people who will be supporting that implementation. The rest of middle school who wouldn't be teaching science, all of these departments are working in one way or another on curriculum revision, um, learning, exploration. And so there are just examples there of, of, the, of exactly the kinds of things that middle school departments could be doing during this time, working with a, a district-directed sort of curricular focus. The biggest advantage to this for middle school is that this will, these days, on a district day, would give us the opportunity for North and South Side middle schools to meet together and, and to work through some of that district-wide alignment. We have, you know, we have a science department at Herrick and a science department at O'Neill. And the experience of them working together on building the science curricula, scope and sequence, looking at the new resources, they're learning from each other. We just had an ELA committee meeting that was just last week, and our, our seventh and eighth grade teachers just sat down and talked for 20 minutes about how do we have common text. So all seventh graders are, are reading The Outsiders, but how are you teaching it? What are you doing to instruct? What kinds of strategies are you using? One of the teachers said, this is amazing. Like if we could, how could we get together and do this more often? I've learned more in this 20 minutes just about there's things I want to try tomorrow. And, and I said, well, the, the Mondays. Like that, that's exactly the kind of experience we're trying to foster to bring that alignment together for our middle school. Our specialists, again, these district-directed days are going to be an opportunity for all of these groups you see on the screen to meet together and be able to spend some focused time on their area of instruction, on, on instructional strategy or curriculum revision and redevelopment or any number of things, again, guided by us, by the people who are responsible for those curricula and for that instruction. It might vary a little bit because the north-south split might not work perfectly in this case for some of these people to get them all together. But again, this gives us that targeted professional learning on a regular basis for our specialist groups as you know, often they are working with other groups of people to help support students, but this will allow us to make sure that their professional learning needs are being met. And then, what are those teacher-directed days going to look like? We know that, that research and best practice tells us that when, when adults have a choice in their own learning, it is more powerful and more meaningful. And we know that our teachers have professional growth goals every year, things they want to work on. They have things they want to learn and, and, and share and research and explore with each other. And so initially, we also know that there's, there's going to need to be some level of accountability for those days. And I think, I think everyone understands that. It, won't, it, it can't just be, we'll see you next week. It, it, it's going to have to be a conversation around what kind of learning experiences do we want to have for everyone. And so teachers would submit an idea to an administrator. This is what I'd like to spend the day on. There might be a menu of choices where it could be these kinds of categories that might look something like what those bullet points on the screen there. And then they'll be able to get together and spend that time with one another. There's really, there's really no overstating the power of educators learning from each other, from being able to talk about the kinds of things they've implemented, to be able to reflect in a, in a comfortable space on how implementation is going, to be able to, to really take the things they're hearing from each other. Maybe it's, again, a group of third grade teachers. Maybe it's a cross-grade level team really talking about what, do you, what, does instruct, what does vocabulary instruction look like across these levels so we can start to gain some of that vertical alignment as well. It'll be things that we haven't even thought of. We heard that from actually one of our principals who said in my previous district, we saw this happen, the implementation, we, we weren't sure how it was gonna work. And what we saw was teachers came up with ideas to pursue that we hadn't even considered and it really moved the needle on the quality of instruction for our students. 
And then again, we come back to another building directive day. That September day might be a chance to talk about the way we're going to approach formative parent-teacher conferences. It might be a chance to review and really look in depth at our school improvement plan at an, at an individual building. What are those goals and how do we consider specific activities to support those goals? It might be some more of those student data meetings, but again, it's another opportunity with an extended period of time to gain cohesion around the kinds of things we as a building staff want to pursue and make sure that we are achieving and reflecting on and holding ourselves accountable for throughout the course of the year. So the key outcome though, because that was one of the big questions, is how will we know the measures on our outcomes? And really this all comes back to the student learning experience. These are quotes that, that Jane and I put together for the presentation in November when we talked about our actual, of, the, of this um, school year, when we talked about professional learning for one of the first times this year. And I think the key is that last quote, that we're spending hours and hours providing our teachers with experiences to enhance their own professional practice and reflect upon it and, and, and space to grow and learn. But that really is because we know that that will benefit our children most directly and most immediately. And that's really what it comes back to. So at, in the end, this should be the kind of experience that allows us to see continued enhancements, improvements, really exciting things for our kids because our teachers will have the time to do even more of the outstanding things they're already doing. From here, um, Carrie mentioned communication as critical. So beginning with the hopeful approval of the school calendar, which would include the early release, we would then start communication pieces going out to all families, brief but regular communications that talk about what the, the calendar will look like and talking about that rationale, really making sure there are many parents here, there are many parents who read the presentations, there are many parents who may not have had a chance to digest some of that rationale. Why are we doing this? Why do we feel it's so important? So many of those things will be coming out. That will turn into an FAQ on the website. We'll have information and registration materials principals will be putting it out in their letters. We'll have informational pieces to the child care agencies so that they know, even if someone were to register who might not be aware that at District 58, Mondays is an earlier time. And then we also do want to want to ask our parents how we can help. We want, to, we want to send something out in early spring to say, as we move into this transition, what are some things that we could do that might ease that transition for your families? Because we do know that this proposal has an impact on every district family. For some, it will be absorbed more easily. For others, it will present challenges, and, and we, don't, we don't take that lightly, and we want to make sure that it is something that we are supporting in, in any way we possibly can as, as a school district. The other um, piece that was discussed a couple weeks ago that has already been part of our plans is we need to know that this is working well, and we need to have ways to ensure accountability. And we'll look at those and make sure that they're asking the right questions, and that'll be something that each teacher will respond to each Monday. So we'll be able to capture really a weekly snapshot of how effective do you feel this is? Are the kinds of things you're working on directly relevant? Was the time meaningful? Could there have been something different? We always leave room for open-ended questions, and, and we've really found throughout the course of the past year or so that um, our, our, our staff is not shy about telling us when they're really excited about things or about telling us when they wish things had been done a little bit differently. And, and we do, we read every single one and we take that into consideration. We also want to continue to survey families once this were to, to begin to, to see if there were unexpected challenges that no one anticipated and things that we might be able to address or if there were solutions that people found that they might be able to share with neighbors across town that might be able to help with things like that. We also know you'll want to hear from us, and so whether it's through the curriculum workshops or if the board desires more regular updates, we can certainly incorporate that over the course of next year. And really, you know, the idea is that, that feedback is going to be ongoing. It's not going to be, let's check in in the fall, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll check a box in October and say we're, we're going to have to, I mean, somebody made the comment that things can start out real strong, and then over time, we need to make sure that the, that the, the Mondays in May are as meaningful as the Mondays in September and October absolutely our obligation and our expectation of ourselves, and that's why we'll continue to solicit that feedback from all of the stakeholders involved throughout the course of the first year and a half, two years of implementation. That brings us to the end of the slide deck. So at this point, I will first ask the board if there are any questions I can, we can respond. This, this last part certainly is a team effort, so any one of us could be responsible. Question. Sure. So one of the things, as you were just kind of talking, that I didn't think of before, but like on Mondays, we currently have band after school. Would the specials be moved to another day because of the, the direct 
link between when school gets out and special start? Would that change? By specials, you mean like band and orchestra? Yes. So that so the things that meet after school, like elementary band and orchestra, right. like um, middle school sports practices and things like that, all of that would not happen on Monday afternoons okay. because we really do want this time to be available for all of our certified staff. That's going to come with some creative scheduling in other places, to be sure, and we're already working on some of those things. But generally speaking, we've got tentative plans in place that, that make it seem like that's not uh, None of that will be impossible. It will just be, again, we'll be communicating early on with families that if your band day used to be Monday, it's not going to be Monday anymore. So we'll work through that. I was just thinking yeah. off the top of my head that that would cause more problems and distress mm -hmm. with figuring out where she would go after school and then right. how she would then get to put that. Right, absolutely. my question, thank you. Thank you. Justin, I was one of the people that raised that I'd like to see what this all looks like, and I think that really has helped me. I now heard you go through it a couple times, so that's helped me even more. Uh, one of the things I really like that you've done is identify those outcomes, the, 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 the goals of what we'd like and the impact you'd like to have in the sessions. I think it, as a board member, when you're reflecting back on that and then reporting back out to us, I think what I'd really like to hear from you is do you feel like you've achieved those outcomes as you're going through the process? So the exit slips, yes, but I, I think really look at you and your team and saying, this is what our goals were, this is what we actually achieved, and this is how we might change to, to adapt if we didn't get there. Because I think when you lay those out, it really helps to explain what some of that real value is to our kids and, and, to, and, and to the teachers to, to be doing this, and do, especially doing some of the things you're doing so early in the year. Yeah, absolutely, and I appreciate that you said look back and change. I, I would hope that part of our presentation would be acknowledging I can't imagine we're going to get it all exactly right the first time. And so I would hope that some of that would be acknowledging we, this happened at a jury. I, I kind of approach, um, you know, in listening to your presentation, I'm also appreciative of being told um, what you expect success to look like, how we're going to get there, and how we're going to measure it. Um, I also appreciate um, the administration finding some information on how this can impact families. Um, my, my one question, so I, I feel a lot more, in a much better place, a lot more comfortable than I did um, two weeks ago. I guess my question is, is actually small um, at this point in time, but I'm wondering, maybe this is a Jane question, um, how does staff attendance um, differ on a Monday compared to other days in the week? Mm -hmm. I'm just making the assumption that Mondays and Fridays are the days where you have um, uh, the most sick days being used, so is that significantly different than a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? I, I don't have off the top of my head. I don't. Sure, I, and yes. I didn't expect you I mean, to. We I do, just, we sure you don't do have that memorized. We do take a look at our, our Mondays and our Fridays. I think that our staff is definitely dedicated to the importance of these days. Mm -hmm. As we've talked sure. even about attendance, it's you know our, our teachers are realizing as well. It, it, it's not going to be absent any day, <laughs> but um, these days are very important, and we yeah. need to have high attendance for the collaborative piece of it. And that's what I'm thinking about Mondays, because mm -hmm. just in, in what you showed us, um, two of the first six or eight Mondays are, are holidays. Um, so I'm just wondering if, I'm sure you've thought about all days, but maybe is there a better option? I don't know. Just want to make sure that all, all um, thoughts are considered there. I, I think that actually is one of the reasons we chose Monday, is to reduce Lots the impact while also maintaining the consistency for our families. Um, but our hope would be that, that our staff, our faculty, really find great value in this time of collaboration and working together with their peers um, in each of these different three kind of buckets that we've identified. And so, um, so I, I, I don't know the actual data of Mondays and Fridays, but I, I feel pretty confident that this will be a really valuable time that people will look forward to and, and would not want to miss if at all possible. And, and I know that's true of most of our days at school as well, so. Sure. That was going to be my question, why did we pick Mondays, mm -hmm. but I think you may have answered that with the holidays, cause, but that may just be about the availability of days, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've heard a number of times over the years from teachers of my own kids, teachers standing up here, that they start losing kids on Friday, so why, why wouldn't we consider Friday? If, what's the most effective time to teach kids? I mean, the younger kids are, the more worn out they get as the week goes mm -hmm. on. So adding 10 more days on a Friday when anything afternoon on a Friday is probably your, or I don't know, but could be your least effective time. Um, 
I, I don't know, that's, that's a question not only I've asked, I've actually been asked that a few times now that this has come out. So um, if we want to make sure we have a clear communication plan, we got to make sure why we say Mondays, because I can guarantee you, we already got one email, well, what's the effect of kids getting 10 minutes every day when kids already get worn out by the end of the day? The other question we've been asked, um, both in meetings and emails over the years and personal questions is, why does this have to be done um, during what are the normal school hours? Why couldn't this be like, don't change the schedule at all and just at, you know, 310 every Monday, you go for an hour. But why does it have to change the school day? There's, there's hours outside of the classroom day. Why, did, why does it have to be there? So not only do you have to answer that question to me, you're gonna have to answer that question when you communicate this out. Um, and then the third is, I just want to make sure that I see some some kind of a written documentation that the that this is really what the teachers want. I, I, I've been, you know, I've heard this a lot before, only to find out a year or two later, people stand up and say, "Well, I never said that." But if this is what we really want, and this is the plan we have, then I want all parties to basically create a document saying we agree to this. That, that would be my preference and the way I would support it. I agree with most of it up here. I do. We need professional development time. I get Mondays because most, of, not most, but many of our holidays, I, obviously more holidays are on Mondays than, than other days of the week, so it, it does limit that. Uh, but you know, we, we'll have to, to communicate some of these things. So I don't know if you want to answer some of those now or get back to me or, or, or what. I mean, I think Carrie spoke to the Monday piece in terms of the of minimizing disruption. There are, there are the least Mondays in attendance already, and so that minimizes the instructional impact. There was also some consideration of the fact that 90, District 99 utilizes Monday as another day that adjusts the schedule. It doesn't align in terms of times necessarily, but it aligns in terms of days, so that as a community, we have four days of instruction completely intact and one day that, it, that is impacted. 99 is specific when they communicated that. It makes the weekend longer so they can sleep in. <laughs> I could look at when they communicate it out. Using that logic, we should be Friday. Right. I think, you know, there, there's a couple considerations. One, anecdotally, is that uh, an early dismissal Friday could start to encourage lack of attendance all day on Fridays. It becomes an easier reason to, to extend the weekend or to, to make the weekend start earlier. That's feedback we got from, from teachers in terms of a potential concern. Another piece to consider is the, the That's time. That's actually really good, good feedback. Yeah. In communication, so you put this out. Right, so we'll, so I mean, I think we'll, I think it's a good point that we'll want as part of the rationale, talking about the, the rationale for each decision that was made. Why is it during the school day? Why is it on Mondays? What, you know, th those kinds of pieces, I think absolutely are the kinds of things that, as I talked about, sort of those short communication pieces. The reality is to, to communicate the entire rationale. No, I don't think anyone would read that email. It would, it would be, there's a lot there. So we're trying to look at some yeah. of those. In, so th but I it's know, a good but at point. least we have something to point to saying, hey, you may not have read it, but we put it out. Well, and that's I, I where mean, that, I don't mean that lightly, but. I agree, and that's yeah. where that FAQ on the, it, it'll all build to an, I, I hate to say this, but we're actually taking a model that ISBE used, because I think, we think they did something really well this fall. When they were talking about a new initiative, they sent out every Tuesday and Thursday for a few weeks, they blasted out just kind of, a, just a, a one sheet that had a reminder of what the initiative was, and a couple of, of new facts each Tuesday and Thursday for several weeks. And so they built to an entire battery of information that it came to families in a, in a digestible way. So these are the kinds of things I think that we are hoping to address uh, in that way. And I, don't, I just want to be careful I don't speak for our entire team, so we can certainly bring some of those points back in a couple of weeks, too. Okay. And the idea is we need to do something. So I, I, I fully support some consistency in professional development, consistency in the schedule. That's, that's important not just for families, it's, just, it's important for teachers, too. You can, all of us are teachers of habit. If we know that we can kind of, it's going to be this day, I got to shift modes and stuff. Right. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I gave you a long list of questions uh, a couple weeks ago for uh, concerns that I had. And, and you, when I read your presentation uh, the other day and, and now I'm hearing you go in more detail, it really does answer the, some of the questions, some of the concerns that I had, especially around around specials and timings, I, 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 I'm glad to see that, that you see some impact on, on um, 
uh, substitute time. I know you're being conservative. Hopefully we can find, because obviously anything that we can do to, you know, bring more face time um, with our, between our students and their teachers is, is really, really important to me. Um, I, for one, like the Mondays, because I was hoping that we weren't going to have many weeks where we we're going to have a, a holiday fall in the week, and then, um, and then now uh, an early dismissal in the same, in the same week, obviously. Um, there, there may be one or two in there, but I think this reduces that, so I, I, uh, I, I did, I did want to note that as well. Um, but yeah, like Elizabeth's point a little bit earlier, I, I would like, you know, the, the presentation that we saw two weeks ago, to Stephen Howe on, on how you're using Seesaw, having a similar presentation on how you've really utilized these days, I think um, not only is helpful for, for me as a board member, but I think that the community can get excited behind what our teachers are learning um, from outside sources, from each other, and, 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 and building wide, and ultimately uh, get a lot of excitement about the growth that we're having in our curriculum. Um, go ahead. I'll come in there. I like the intentionality around uh, we're, in, we're in February. We're talking about professional learning in September. Um, it's, I've, divi I've designed professional development for teachers. It's a lot easier to do a three days of PD. It's a fixed cost. You design that time, and then you move on to the next semester. Of PD. Uh, it's a lot harder to do weekly, consistent, great, high-quality PD. And so I think the lead time we're providing ourselves here to be intentional about scheduling, about content, uh, is great. Uh, when I design PD, the easiest part among all of it being difficult, the easiest part was coming up with high level like structure. The second easiest part was coming up with specific content areas or topic areas. I'll leave it the hardest part that I spent like all nighters on was on actual content for that day. And at some point somebody's somebody in the district is going to be taking on that capacity. And I know we've talked about potential new roles or potential new ways to structure roles. Um, when will we start to talk about the where that capacity falls around it? What will our principals take on of our instructional coaches, a particular curriculum coordinator, teachers individually, just so they can prepare for that new muscle to flex? Because a weekly intentional PD to do with high quality needs an owner. It needs a real owner that's like, taking it all the way. Yes, you're stressing me out front. No, yes, I think that I think <laughs> they're, they're absolutely, I mean, it's, it's a really valid point. There is, uh, our hardest work is yet to come, for sure, in developing all of this. And I think that we, we do, we typically take a team approach to this kind of development. You know, even the building develop days, our principals will take time over the course of, of meetings where they're together to, to brainstorm ideas and, and, and talk to each other about the kinds of, the kinds of things they're going to do, the types of activities they'll implement to, to increase that. And we see some of that shared ownership even at the building level. For those district-directed days, I mean, I think, I think ultimately that is the way we plan our grade level meetings now, for example, is a, is, is a team effort. We look through, we, we receive teacher feedback on the kinds of things they want to do. So, you know, if we take that from a curricular lens, we're looking to the committees to talk about what kinds of experience and what kinds of support do we need to provide because the committee members, in theory, are a year ahead, right? They've had a pilot experience. They've lived it a little bit. They're coming through it for a second time. That's the approach we're taking with ELA. That's the approach even with science. Our teachers would have had some exposure. The, the rest of the year, that committee will spend time talking about what kinds of things do we want to put in place. And then it will have to get centralized at some point through our administrative team, hopefully including some new people. And when we hopefully have some of those new people, that's when we'll really start to develop the, the structure of who will be where when and, and where will the, the onus of some of that be. And there, it's, it's, it is, there's a lot of uh, development yet to come, and I think we're, we're excited about that work, but we want to we make sure we have, the, like you said, the higher level structures in place before we get to that level. One quick question, and then a couple of comments. Uh, how, does this have any effect on any of these SACID rooms that we lease out? No. Uh, Would there be any impact to them? No, the, the students who attend a SACID program that is hosted in our schools uh, run a slightly alternate schedule as it is, so we would work with them to ensure that there isn't any conflict in that schedule. 
Um, but as I'm thinking of it right now, and Jessica, I'm looking at you to see if there's anything I'm, I'm not thinking of. I think at this point, there would not be a direct conflict with any of those times. We would just have to make sure that we're coordinating. Right. Thank you for that. Sure, question. you're thinking of it. I just. Mm -hmm. okay. So yes, what Carrie said. Yes, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, comments are, I, I think, if the teachers are excited, I'm excited. Uh, this has been a long time coming. Mm -hmm. uh, to have something consistent without big gaps in between. Mm -hmm. And from what, I, what I've heard a little bit is that they, they really value not having to wait so long between professional development times. Um, so I think this is a, this is a great step. Um, also very happy to hear that we're helping as much as we can the parents who need it. Uh, we can only do so much, but getting that information out early is, is good. And uh, finally, I, ha I had a point that Darren brought up was we need to advertise what we're doing. I fully agree with that. Uh, I personally get a lot of questions throughout the year, and in particular recently, since this has come up, is what goes on on those days? What are they doing? So if we can have something, presentations on the website, maybe some videos, or, or we see it, I think that would be fantastic for the community. Absolutely. Yeah, thank and to, you. to speak to the teachers being excited point, because I, I didn't mention that, I never really brought it up. Yes, I mean, I, I, I believe that teachers are generally very excited about this time. Every time we've presented this concept to a group of teachers, we, we work through a few guiding questions around how would you like to see the time used and, and, and what challenges do you see? And to be sure, each group of teachers has come up with some exciting ideas and, and a couple of things that we need to consider to, to make sure this is successful. But the, the closing question that we kind of go with is assuming all of that is attainable and that we're able to, 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 to cross the hurdles that you may have identified, how are you feeling about this in general as a concept? Are you and and with, without fail, there is, there is positive energy. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the reception of visitors. Anyone wishing to address the board is asked to state your name, school attendance area, and speak as briefly as possible. The board is allotting 30 minute time frame for the extended opportunity for board and community communications. We ask that everyone be respectful of time limits, be respectful of others, and otherwise abide by board policy. So we have a few cards. So right now we have five cards, so um, we'll try to go, um, you know, about five minutes each, and then whatever is open at the end for people who might want to speak who didn't fill out a card. Uh, first is uh, Katie Herkus with the DGEA. Next is Allison Rizal. Hi. Well, first I wanted to thank you. I'm glad that um, particularly art curriculum is being um, expanded. And um, I'm, I do have a question. I know you guys can't answer questions, but I'm curious about the length of the. We can, we can answer oh, questions. Oh, can. Well. Okay. I'm, good. <laughs> okay. I'm curious about the length of the middle school portion of art. I, I just didn't notice the weeks on there. I was just curious if you had a set amount of weeks in mind. 
for yes. that? The, the okay. seventh grade class will be about 10 and a half weeks. Okay. There's an exact number of days in there. And then okay. the, all of the eighth grade classes, there are four classes, so they'll be roughly nine weeks each. They'll, okay. they'll run sort of on the open course. That's much better. And um, I know they'll have to be creative with the 30 minutes in elementary to get the job done, maybe teaching for artistic behaviors or um, stations. It'll have to be a, a different means than traditional instruction. Um, but at any rate, um, I'm just curious about the, 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 the day being shortened. I'm curious about middle school because I teach middle school and when they shorten the class periods, especially for classes like PE or art, it puts a real burden on the teacher to be effective in a short amount of time. So I'm wondering if every week, if they'll get a more limited education than they would, which would be a 20% impact on their education if we look at it you know, in a regular week. Um, so I'm concerned about that, and I wonder if there's going to be five minutes added on to every day after that, or five minutes added on to every period, every day, I'm guessing? So the, the, the best answer I can give you right now is those are exactly some of the concerns that the middle school teachers mm -hmm. raised as we started talking about the impact, that mm -hmm. the, the complexity of the middle school schedule does, does cause us to mm -hmm. have to take a, a, a close look at what that will mean and what the best ways are to accomplish some of those things. So as, as Jane mentioned, there's already one day that is, that's currently impacted with short periods, and so mm -hmm. we're, we're involved in conversations about we actually are forming a middle school scheduling committee to take a look at just those things with teachers and administrators over the course of the next, um, really, several months, a few months leading mm -hmm. into next year, and then thinking about long-term potential uh, scheduling impacts as well. My opinion would be like, even if they removed study hall that day and made the class periods the same, just to try to help the teachers be able to teach. Um, but anyway, um, I'm curious too, like the link, they never responded to my, an email just from yesterday, but they didn't seem, at least like the person I see daily was not looped in on changes possible for next year. I know it hasn't been approved yet, but they were not aware and they only work with uh, 58 right now as a child care provider. Um, and then, if you could provide that, the name, and you can do it maybe later. Okay. Um, if you're talking about child care provider, we, we really are working to connect with any okay, child Okay, so provider, they're not child yet care provider. So in. It, maybe it's one that we're not aware of or our principals aren't aware of. Oh. So the link was on your them. list that you're aware of, so I was just concerned, oh, like, if you had checked with them, the, maybe. The link, the park the link, district. Yeah, the park district link. Yeah. So that may have been the facilitator, not the um, director of the okay. program at the district, the park district level. Okay. Thank I just you. hope that it all works out, you know. And then, um, <laughs> you know, and then with middle schoolers, like the idea of like, I'm wondering if for families, if 99 has a late start, your teachers would be fresh in the morning. If it was a late start in middle school, there's lots of studies about the loss of sleep. Mm -hmm. So you'll have roaming middle schoolers in the afternoon after two, or you'll have ones that are sleeping most likely if you do a late start. But just a thought, you know, and to bring it together for families, like a high schooler maybe at home then to oversee, you know, a smaller child, you know, a younger child. But anyway, that's an idea. Um, but other than that, I don't know if I have too much more. I don't want to take too much time. But uh, professional development, I think sometimes too, there's a specialness to having it once in a while. I get the consistency aspect, but um, it's professional development. Sometimes as a teacher, I get irritated when I feel like the development is not professional enough. Like maybe I want a professional to help me, mm -hmm. to show me things. Then sometimes like a bunch of teachers who might be overburdened trying to present to me because they are not able to have the time to do those things. You know, when we think about teachers proposing ideas, it all sounds good in theory because they're the front lines, but will they be able to make an effective presentation for teachers as well as students? So I'll touch on that, and Justin, maybe you wanted to mention something else about middle school scheduling. I see, saw you jumping in there. Um, in terms of the professional days, mm -hmm. um, we still are maintaining those um, institute days, which mm -hmm. are when uh, we more likely will be bringing in um, additional professionals or mm -hmm. support personnel. Because you're right, there are some there is some learning that is really critical to have a full block of time mm -hmm. as opposed to an hour, an hour and a half of collaboration mm -hmm. time. So we'll have to think strategically about what fits best for our teachers um, on those institute days as opposed to on the early dismissal days. Mm -hmm. And again, we have some examples from other districts and mm -hmm. we've already started to think of some of those ideas. Um, so you're absolutely right, there needs to be a balance there of the kind of learning 
and the kind of collaboration that our teachers are exposed to and, mm -hmm. and uh, supported to participate in. Okay. Justin, you were going to say something? I'm just going to briefly speak to the late start idea. It, it's actually something we did consider and, and looked at a line with 99. There's a mm -hmm. couple of challenges. One is that because 99 does it and we share a bus company, that the timing was either really, we, we'd have a, we would have a, a, an almost not late start at all or a very, very late start. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. The other piece is that, and, and middle school for sure is the, is the transition ground, but the same research on when you know middle school, high school students perform best actually mm -hmm. tips when you look at our youngest learners. And so it's kind of trying to find that balance point of you know, our, our, our kindergartners and our first graders aren't necessarily needing to sleep, they're, they're needing the break at the end of the day. So it, it, there's, there's definitely pros and cons on both sides of that. And my pick for, my husband thought too, Wednesdays is a good pick, I think, for if you have to do early release, um, it gives you that midweek breather, and then a lot of kids have like religious ed or confirmation. I don't know, it just seems like, if you had to pick a day, like, I don't know, Wednesday, consistent, you get that midweek breather. Everyone's usually at work or school, they're in a mode, you know, where, you know, maybe one day is different, but the two in front and the two behind are the same. I don't know, just a thought. And uh, thank you. I mean, the science teacher is excited about the new curriculum at O'Neill. So, I mean, I, I think you're making a lot of good changes. And, you know, math has been a long time coming. So thanks a lot for all the work you've done. Thank you. Thank you for your comments as well. Uh, next is Craig Young with the DGEEA. Thank you. Um, Craig Young, and I, I just wanted to speak. I thought maybe the, how are the teachers feeling about this professional development plan question might come up, so I, I wanted to put my name in there and give it me, myself a chance to speak to it. I certainly, like Katie, cannot speak for every teacher by any means, or, or specialist, or all the other jobs that are included there. Um, but for me, this is a really important piece of, of the puzzle that we're putting together right now. Uh, a lot of curriculum movement, uh, very quickly which is needed and it's important, uh, but it's difficult to execute that well. And I think this professional development piece is really gonna be critical as we, as teachers, try and, and really just do the best we can with the investments that the board and the taxpayers are making. Uh, we've bought curriculum, or we're going to continue to buy curriculum, we've bought devices, uh, and we wanna be able to use those to the best uh, that, that they're capable of. And when you're trying to uh, do that without the proper professional development, I think that's really difficult. So I really feel like this is going to be a piece that's, that's really integral to the success of the, the whole plan that we saw up there all laid out. Um, and then I, I was listening to the discussion and you guys had some uh, really interesting points that I thought kind of played into this. Um, Member Doshi was talking about looking at benchmark and what the uh, impact was on our MAP scores. Uh, again, I think this professional development is going to help Benchmark be as successful as it possibly can be. Uh, Member Harris was talking about looking at map data, um, doing more than crossing our fingers. And I thought, this is the more right here, you know, giving that those teachers uh, time to learn from our district leaders, learn from professional lear uh, people from the curriculum learn from companies, other. and then learning from each other, you know, that collaboration. Uh, in my mind, that's, that's going to be huge, too, is just to collaborate with each other, learn from each other, what's working well for you, let's try and do that a little more universally. Uh, the consistency of this, I think, is really gonna help us a lot as well. Uh, so I, I just wanted to you know, put myself out there and say, I think teachers are really gonna like this. Um, the ones that I've talked to have been very excited about it. Um, I know, Member Miller, you talked about doing a survey um, at the last meeting, and I would encourage you to do that because I'd be curious to see, just like you, uh, what, what teachers would say when given that anonymous opportunity, but um, what I've heard, you know, just anecdotally has been really positive. So. Right, absolutely. Well, and I don't either, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Right, no, and I, 
think those are all good points. They're but all good point. Every at the end of the day, we got to go for it. We got to try something and just and just do it, and and then get all that feedback and you know see what happens and change it for next year if that makes sense. Yeah, it's um, a balloon analogy, right? No matter how you squeeze the balloon, something pops out on the other side. Right. So you get it no matter what time you pick or what you pick. There's going to be something that happens. Unless Absolutely. you figure out how to make more than Right. We're still working on that. Well, none of us are questioning. I don't think that that there's consensus around PD. I think that. What we want to make sure is that the model, that there's consensus around the model, that, that the impact on, on, the, on each of your teachers' teaching day, right. that, that that's something that they're comfortable absorbing. Um, shrinking down that Monday and having to, to, to fill that day and making sure that that is a comfortable place for them to be is really, really important. Yeah. That we're not getting pushed back a year or two from now going, those Mondays that, that the two o'clock release day is, is a nightmare for us to try to get this stuff done. Right. You know, we're just trying to I hear about, you. before we go about making a big change that impacts families and teachers and, and everybody else, we want to make sure that, that there's a consistent level of comfort. Yeah, across the no. and I think there's legitimacy to those concerns. Um, I, I, I really do. But I also think there's no way to, to do benchmark justice or our new STEM TCI STEM thing that we've got K-5 justice, or to do the iPads for that matter justice without having this time. Um, it's just, it's so disjointed, this consistency. And me personally, having it on Monday, I think is gonna be great for us. Uh, you really have that motivation that you can implement whatever you've worked on, whatever you've learned throughout that week right then. You know, you can just put it into practice right away. Uh, as opposed to the Friday, you know, thing. Um, I, I sometimes remind myself that grown-ups are really just, you know, kids that 20 years later uh, and so you know Fridays Fridays are, are not always the greatest thing for for us either so um, just to, that's just me that's not all the teachers say yeah. just, just me all right, awesome yep. thank uh, you guys thank you thanks Troy. every adult not every child thank you uh, next is Carrie uh, Blondin Blondin sorry I have um, just a quick question. Um, on the map assessments, has there been any discussion or thought as opposed to doing, we talked about assessment burnout, instead of doing it three times a year, maybe twice a year? Because I've gotten the comment a couple of times now, and I haven't been like in the district very long, that when the, when the winter ones come out, it's like, well, that's okay. Just the spring is really, we're looking at the fall and the spring, not so much the winter. Um, Yes, so we have another committee not listed tonight, believe it or not, that, uh, <laughs> that's called the Differentiation and Assessment Committee. And, and Jessica and I co-chair that committee, and that is actually one of the topics on that committee's agenda for our, our next, one of our next meetings coming up, whether it'll be an, an impact for next year or the, for the future year or at all. There's certainly talk around the amount of assessment, and you know, in MAP we have ultimate control over, it's our choice to, to administer it. We've talked about our, do, do we need to do all of the assessments every time? We, you know, winter comes up sometimes, in other districts fall comes up. You know, we have the spring data from the most recent point of instruction, and then we, t we take a new set of data in the fall, and, and, and that they, they tell us similar but different things. So the short answer is yes, we are having that conversation, and there has been, there has, that, that comment has come up before around you know, wanting to make sure, you know, assessment is, is, is meaningful and powerful, it's used well, but we also want to make sure that we're, we're teaching much more than we're assessing. And then I'm just, since everyone's talking about it, I'm gonna throw my two cents in about the professional development <laughs> at the Mondays. What I think is really cool about that is less substitute time. And I think that gets lost in the, oh my gosh, we're gonna get out early and I need to find childcare. To have less substitutes in the classroom, I think is really the huge thing in this. Um, because I don't think the parents realize it um, as much as it happens. Not that it's an all the time thing, but it's kind of surprising when you have your kids come out and they're like, oh, I had so-and-so today because these teachers were gone, or because these teachers were gone. To have some of those um, grade level meetings um, or subject meetings or committee meetings not happen during school time, that I think is the big thing and uh, that, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Eddie. Pampalum. Hi, um, so I'm Addie Pampalum. Um, I have kids at Whittier. Um, I was 
thinking that this curriculum like workshop was going to be like last year, so I was hoping just to snag like an instructional coach to ask like to pick their brain. Um, so I wasn't really even like planning on like standing up here like this. But my question really stems is about the new um, ELA benchmark curriculum for K through um, five. My current sixth grader was one of the pilot classes last year in fifth grade, so I kind of knew already about like benchmark for this year. And so you guys had the training workshop last spring or fall, whenever it was last year. Um, but um, so I kind of I knew already that it was like just you know definitely more challenging, um, and I felt like my daughter just did when she was fifth grade, so it could be a little bit just different for you know from year to year in school. Um, and I felt like they just kind of got better at taking it, just because they were more familiar with the with the like, test. And like I definitely it's, it is a good curriculum. But it's tough, and I'm not finding my fourth grader. Um, I'm finding it to be almost like disheartening, and as like to kids, and like talking to like multiple people about it. Um, I think that we're losing some of the excitement of reading, um, and I know that it's like the teachers like have done just a great job as far as I me. Mean, they have to like they take the assessment themselves. And it's not a quick, it's not a quick assessment. And like the articles, like in their I mean, the stories, if you ever look at them, but, like, I mean, they're kind of boring. And like I'm like, that's coming from like a 42-year-old versus like a nine-year-old boy, you know, who's taking them. So I'm just wondering if there any, is there any way that, and like then I know the teachers have to then read them and grade them. And I just I feel like I mean, there's really nothing, and it comes home in like a Friday folder, and I just I just have to keep my mouth shut so I don't just kind of just go off on my child for like, how did you get a two and then a three and then like we're inconsistent and I'm not seeing the growth from the beginning of the year to now. And maybe it's something that I feel like maybe if like the instructional coaches can help the parents go over things at home. I'm not sure, I'm just, I'm finding, I don't want kids to become like disinterested in reading because the curriculum is, is there any way that teachers are, are teachers allowed to have some flexibility? Because I feel like in, when my daughter was in fourth grade, they got to read a couple different novels, have like study groups, and it kind of got them like excited about reading. And like that's kind of I feel like in fourth grade, like the tipping point for a lot of kids as far as like maturity and like kind of just it, it's just a big change between third and fourth. And I'm just my concern with the new curriculum is although it's fabulous and it definitely prepares, I just don't want it to disengage in kids from wanting to like just enjoy reading. And I feel like, is there a middle ground that somehow we can come to? Or if we can do a workshop, I mean, I know unfortunately it's not, you know, we can get more parents to come to these things, but can the instructional coaches somehow do like a 45 minute or even a half an hour, like down and dirty, how we can like try to help our kids, you know, not be so like, oh, this was so hard. I'm not, it, the teacher says it's hard, so it's just hard. I don't, it just. So that is a great idea. And it's one of the things that actually has come up in a couple of different places with the Curriculum Council around making sure that we're doing probably a, a better job, if I'm being honest, of giving parents the tools to understand and support the new curriculum that's coming out. And so I think that that is definitely something that the Curriculum Council is talking about as part of our overall sequence. And it, and it is certainly something we can, we can take back in the, in the short term, both for Benchmark and Study Sync, which is the 6-8 resource, and for the science that's coming yeah, and, and out. And seems like it's just completely different than benchmark it and is. like they like it and it's a little bit easier and, and or maybe they're just used to it i'm not sure and to the other piece i think i think that yes certainly do teachers have flexibility they do in the first year of implementation, we have encouraged teachers to stick pretty close to what is in that resource because that really is the best way to learn it the first time before we start supplementing with what we are comfortable with or what we are most familiar with. It's, it's, it, that is challenging. I mentioned um, balanced literacy at one point in the presentation tonight, and that's actually one of the things that the ELA committee, again, the people who are two years in now, are looking at is, is to say there are, we know there are things Benchmark does really well. We need to make sure that we're not missing some of those other components as, we, as we're going through. And it, and it does, the, you know, a, a quality implementation like that does take a couple of years before we'll sort of level off maybe to the, okay, we now know exactly what we need from Benchmark, and here are some of the places we can bring back some of those other supplemental things that teachers have developed and, and are really excited about and, and are enhancements. 
sense. But I, I think that, you know, I think, I think for sure with a resource like Benchmark, mileage is going to vary by child and by teacher in the first year, especially the first couple of years. And I think we're, we're hoping to see that continue to, you know, to, to, to become more manageable and more familiar. And, and when it's, you know, when it's, when it's more familiar, it gets a little easier and it gets a little, hopefully, less, um, it, it, it remains even more engaging. And then the truth is, too, the pacing of a teacher going through it the second year or later in the year as they're becoming more comfortable is also going to play into that engagement as we start to move with a, a little more, um, with a little more speed, honestly, through the resources as we become more involved. So they're all, those are all pieces of feedback we've heard in, in different places and, and the committee is working to take that into account. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure, you know, they're not just taking the assessments. I feel, is the feeling I'm getting, they're just taking the assessments and they're not getting to like, because they need to get onto the next assessment. Maybe we just need to like do an assessment, maybe not so many in a row, but we can like then find, you know, pick it out with the students and kind of go over it together so that they can learn from it. I feel like they haven't had that opportunity to learn how to do better on the next one. Yeah, the assessment frequency is quite literally on the agenda from our last committee. <laughs> <laughs> so Perfect. I, okay. People are nodding in the room. Right. Yeah, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I would just add, um, a parent education series is something that was, was alluded to a little bit, and I think that as part of our strategic plan, that is something that we are looking at re reinstituting for the upcoming school year. Um, we focus this year really on communication, um, internal and external, and some of those feedback loops, um, and want to um, start to generate some ideas for implementation next year. Some of you might recall uh, a couple of years ago when we uh, went on the road with a couple of different parent ed series and uh, we, we think those, there's some valuable supports that we could provide to parents as we're implementing many of these new curricula. So uh, we look forward to that uh, in the upcoming school year as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we do have a few more minutes if anyone um, who didn't fill out a card would like to speak. So I think the, this year we have a few things that are going to impact the K-6 schedule. We have, we have the potential of early release. We have the addition of weekly art. We have the shifting of art from 40-minute lessons to 30-minute lessons, which is actually going to help the schedule align across buildings in a really, in a really powerful way. And, and we are, we are, and honestly what, we, what that leads us to do is take a look at the number of instructional minutes in a week and start to help you know, give guidance from the district as to how many weekly minutes of instruction should there be in each place. So that's something that will be shared with teachers as we, as we talk about programming and, and, and planning. It's also part of you know, looking to add that 10 minutes on per day, uh, you know, which will actually, as Jane mentioned tonight, will recapture some hours of instructional time. So it may not necessarily be exactly what's going away. It may be that we're actually gonna gain seven, eight, nine hours of time over the course of the school year that will help to offset some of that. So I, I, I can't give you the exact answer for what goes away in the sense of, well, we're going to take five minutes from here because we haven't gotten all the way down the road with those conversations. But each year, we do, we do provide for teachers a guidance document that says, here, here are your weekly instructional minutes per grade level in math, in science, in social studies, and, and those kinds of things. And we're already looking at places where you know, science and social studies need to be taught explicitly on their own. There are, there are explorations and skills that are, that are there for sure. There's also, with our new resources, a lot more opportunity for crossover so that when we're reading text, the science um, content in, 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 in ELA, for example, some of, the, some of those nonfiction texts that are a little harder to get through are actually directly aligned to the content that the science standards will be asking of us next year. So some of it we can we hope to capture in some of that crossover time as well. So, um so if it's district-driven, saying everyone's going to get that extra art, 
Is it left up to the individual buildings how the makeup of the day and how they do the matrix of stuff then? It, at this point, it, it, it didn't really, that's not really. There has, there certainly has been some, there is building level decision making around what the master schedule in a building looks like to be sure. There are some different parameters and we, we do have conversations as an administrative team about the ways we want to, you know, the things we want to make sure are in all schedules versus the things that will be in some building schedules or others based on some of the individual needs which can be based on number of sections and size and size of playground, for example, in terms of when and how we're accomplishing some of these things. So it's a balance for sure. Okay, and then my other question was um, under professional development with the um, early release with the teacher-led days, um, is teacher, because I, I don't know, but is teacher-led meaning um, they decide ahead of time what that topic is gonna be or is it teacher-led literally like the instructional coaches teaching them, are you gonna be bringing people in? Because um, that's feedback I have definitely heard um, sitting on the curriculum council is that they're seeking not that the instructional coaches aren't professionals, but they're actually seeking outside people to come. So the the teacher directed, and I want to be careful because I can't. I don't. Have okay. No, but but, because, but but that's actually the difference because it won't necessarily be that we're going to say teacher A is going to craft a ninety minute learning presentation for teachers B through G. It's more that that a teacher is going to be able to connect with some colleagues and say wouldn't it be great if we spent some time exploring this new concept or talking about how we can enhance this science unit or looking back, looking forward at our next benchmark unit and talking about some how you've implemented these things and, and what, what different things we can learn from each other in those kinds of moments. So it may, not, it may not necessarily be as formal as some of that in terms of those things. Now, if a, if a group of teachers were to get together and say, hey, could we have 90 minutes with the benchmark rep to talk about this? Or, you know, on some of the district-directed days as our art teachers are working on their new, the curricular revision, could we, could we have someone come in who's a, a really an expert in the field and support us with that? Those are things we, we are able to make happen in isolated moments now and certainly want to explore. But those, the idea behind those teacher days really is that, yes, teachers would, you know, some of the feedback we do get is, is we as educators, we, we know what we need to spend time on. We know our, you know, we ask our teachers to set professional growth goals each year. So this is a place for them to identify people that they can learn from and work with on some of those things. So it's really more of a, of a, of a, of a, a guided, you know, collaborative session where teachers, in, in some ways, in other ways, that, you know, we don't know what all teachers will ask for. But yes, they'll submit some, this is how I or me and these 12 other teachers would like to spend this particular Monday. Okay, so the board also kind of asked this, but is it is it going to be fluid or is it going to be pre like when the teachers go to come in in August, they'll know that, is it already going to be set or is it going to be on the fly? Meaning like in September or somewhere in between that. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, it's probably not going to be set in August, not, but yes. it, it won't be on the fly either. But maybe There's a like month, a yeah, maybe a month out or, or with some planning ahead. Um, those days might look a little more like professional learning teams, teams of teachers getting together to collaborate as opposed to a sit and get kind of a presentation. Um, we see much of the value in this time together as being collaborative time, whether they're doing collaborative work with large groups of teachers directed by the district um, at their building level, directed or led or facilitated or kind of organized by the building principal, or um, teacher identified activities that are um, groups of teachers getting together to work on an identified goal area um, or learning or collaboration together. Um, it's much less of the sit and get is, is what we're envisioning using this early dismissal time for. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So we are past our time limit. If, any, if anyone has other questions or concerns, please feel free to email myself or any board member uh, and administrator and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> a couple of announcements. Uh, the Legislative Committee will meet Wednesday, February 27th at 4 p.m. at ASC. Uh, there's a special meeting closed session, Superintendent Search Workshop. That's uh, March 5th at 6.30 at the ASC. There's also a special meeting, which is a closed session interview for superintendents, March 7th at 6 p.m. at the ASC. Uh, March 9th at the ASC is another night of superintendent interviews. Uh, that's at 2 p.m., that's an afternoon. And the Board of Education and Community Meet and Greet will be Monday, March 11th at 6 p.m. at Village Hall. 
uh, before the regular board meeting, which starts at 7 p.m. that night. Uh, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district uh, and collective bargaining or collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or the representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees? Some of Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Sinanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess at 9.15 p.m.